Welcome to our channel. Today's story has a very unusual and dynamic beginning, but after a couple of minutes of watching, you will understand what it was about. I screamed in fright when I saw Barbara, and she immediately covered her naked body with a blanket. Josh, who was also in the room, turned around with wide open eyes, and his hands hurriedly gathered clothes scattered all over the bedroom. However, a vase flying past his head prevented him from doing that. The man in his underwear jumped out of the open window and ran to his car. My wooden bat flew after him and hit the headlight, breaking it. The car quickly drove away from my yard, disappearing among the narrow streets. All this happened within one minute. Yes, you understood correctly. I just caught my wife cheating in our house, in our bedroom, in our bed, and I had just come home to change clothes because I got very dirty at work. My new colleague, a young and cute girl was extremely clumsy. She was carrying several cups of coffee in her hands and tripped over her own foot, causing the hot drinks to spill on me and smear my shirt and pants. My boss, being an understanding woman, offered me to go home and change my clothes. Under Barbara's plaintive crying and excuses, I went to the closet and started changing. Deliberately, I did not react to her words. It seemed to me that if I talked to her, all the anger inside me would explode, and I could do something illegal and violent towards her. It took all the willpower to maintain outward calmness. The maximum I could do was tell her to pack up and leave before I returned from work. I left the house, got into the car, and drove to work. Apparently, my condition showed that something had happened because my colleagues began asking about my health. They said I looked like I had just returned from a war. Well, it wasn't far from the truth. There really was a real war going on inside me until the end of the workday. I just sat in front of the computer monitor, not reacting to what was happening around. All I wanted was to go to a bar and get drunk with my best friend. That's exactly what I did. Immediately after work, I called my friend and asked him to meet at a bar near my house. Probably my tone made it clear that something was wrong because he agreed to come over soon without further questions. Now I vaguely remember that evening. We drank a lot of whiskey and beer, talked about my divorce from Barbara. My best friend helped me catch a taxi and walked me to the doors of my house. Now this house did not look like a cozy and homely shelter. It became too quiet and empty. There were only my shoes in the hallway. The bedroom looked neat as if nothing had happened there. The closets, chests of drawers, bathroom, even the kitchen were empty. Barbara really took absolutely all her stuff. Even her potted plants were gone somewhere. It felt like someone had just moved into this house and hadn't finished settling in yet. I couldn't stay calm in the bedroom. Now it's the most hated, disgusting room for me, so I was sleeping on the couch in the living room. In the morning, my head was hurting terribly. It seemed it was about to split into pieces from the hellish, pulsating pain. I struggled to open my eyes, the sunlight piercing through the undrawn curtains causing pain. I sat on the couch, and the room began to spin, accompanied by the rising nausea in my throat. Managing to reach the bathroom, I threw up the remnants of yesterday's drinking, the hangover hit me like a truck, my head buzzing, mouth dry, and stomach cramped. With great effort, I forced myself to take a shower, brush my teeth, shave, and get dressed. Every movement felt incredibly difficult. Finally, I returned to the living room and collapsed on the couch. The thought of preparing for work alone made everything go dark before my eyes. Lethargically, I reached for the phone to call my boss and inform her I wouldn't be coming in today. However, my gaze fell on Barbara's photo on the nightstand, and memories of yesterday hit me hard. Hatred and disappointment overwhelmed me with renewed force. Suppressing those emotions, I knew the main thing now was to survive this hellish workday and see what happens next. Despite the severe hangover, I decided to go to work. In the empty house filled with memories of Barbara, I felt even worse, longing to switch my attention to other tasks and change the scenery. 
My colleagues immediately noticed my detached state, joking that I had apparently overindulged in alcohol the night before. Unable to bear it any longer, I shared the truth with them, how I caught Barbara with her lover, how he jumped out the window, and how my wife left the house. My colleagues were horrified and involuntarily cursed my wife, recognizing the severity of my situation. Their sincere sympathy and support touched me, providing the strength to endure the rest of the workday, despite struggling to think straight and focus on simple tasks due to the hangover. After work, a sympathetic colleague offered to have coffee and talk. She inquired about my plans, and I firmly decided to divorce Barbara, as the marriage no longer made any sense to me. In the next few days, I intended to consult with a lawyer to understand the legal details of divorce and protect my rights as best as possible. I was also deeply concerned about our children with Barbara. They are only five and seven years old, and it will be hard for them to endure their parents' divorce. I wanted to give them as much attention as possible, take them to parks, movies, zoos, in short, do everything to make them feel needed and loved during this difficult time. Besides, in case of a divorce, of course, I wanted to fight for custody of the children. I had a feeling that Barbara wouldn't be able to properly take care of them after finding a lover. I didn't want the children to grow up in a dysfunctional environment. Their safety and comfort were my top priority overall. Despite the shock and pain of betrayal, I was determined. The main thing is to go through the divorce with dignity and minimize losses for the children, and life will get better in time. After talking to my colleague, I decided to call my parents. Our children were staying with them on vacation. I bluntly announced that I caught Barbara cheating and was planning a divorce. My parents were shocked. They had no idea there were problems in our relationship. Despite the shock, they promised to take care of the grandchildren for as long as needed. Don't worry, son, my mom said. Leave the kids with us for as long as you need. You're going through tough times right now, and your dad and I will be happy to spend more time with our grandchildren. You know how much we love them. My dad also expressed support. What an atrocity on Barbara's part. I would have never thought so, but you're doing the right thing getting divorced. And don't worry about the kids, they'll be fine with us. I felt relieved, at least I didn't have to worry about the kids for now. Meanwhile, I could focus on the divorce proceedings and restoring my mental balance after these challenging times. Events, incidentally, on this difficult day, were the first time I even looked at my phone. After calling my parents, I saw dozens of missed calls and text messages from my wife, Barbara, she was probably trying to justify herself, begging for forgiveness, or cursing in response, but I didn't care. I didn't even read those messages. I deleted everything without looking. Instead, I asked my acquaintances if they had contacts for a good divorce lawyer. One friend gave me the number of an excellent specialist his sister went to. I immediately called that lawyer. Luckily, he happened to be available the next day, and we agreed to meet and discuss everything. I felt confident that this experienced attorney would help me properly handle the divorce and defend my interests. However, the lawyer cooled my ardor. It turned out I had no right to kick Barbara out of our common home. That was considered illegal eviction of a spouse. She could easily sue me for that. Moreover, Barbara was fully entitled to return home at any time and demand that I continue living with her in marriage until the official divorce. In the current situation, the law was clearly on her side. If she does sue me, it would greatly complicate the whole divorce process and reduce my chances of getting custody of the children in the future. I was horrified by this news. So I'm absolutely powerless to do anything against Barbara. I'll have to endure her presence in my own home for a long time and also risk losing my children because of her potential lawsuit. It felt like a nightmare. All my determination vanished in an instant. In your situation, it's very likely that Barbara will get custody and you'll pay alimony. Our objective now is to minimize your losses after the divorce, said the lawyer. 
On the one hand, now I knew my legal prospects and options regarding the divorce. That was useful to understand further steps. The lawyer competently answered all my questions. On the other hand, some things burdened and scared me, especially the fact that Barbara could return home at any moment, and I wouldn't be able to do anything about it or that she could significantly complicate me getting custody of the children. I felt relieved that I now understood all the nuances of the divorce process, but simultaneously I was anxious and annoyed by my own helplessness. The future fate of the children was also a constant source of worry. This mixture of conflicting emotions kept me on edge, feeling slightly calmer one minute and then agitated the next. I walked down the street, absorbed in my thoughts and concerns, facing difficult decisions on how to proceed in such an uncertain situation. Over the next few days, I tried to keep it together and not lose my mind over the uncertainty. Monette kept calling me, but I stubbornly didn't pick up. Every day, I half expected her to show up at the door with suitcases. On Friday, I picked the kids up from my parents to spend the weekend with them. On Saturday, we went together to our favorite pizzeria and played bowling, and the children were delighted. For a moment, it even seemed that everything was fine. Just a dad with his kids spending a carefree day. However, Closer to the evening, when the kids and I were watching a cartoon before bed, the doorbell suddenly rang unexpectedly. I froze, realizing it was Barbara. The kids happily screamed, Mom! and rushed to meet her. She stood at the door with a huge suitcase and several bags. The guilty smile on her face said it all. Hi, can I come in? After all, this is still my house too. The perfect day collapsed in an instant. When the children went to their rooms and fell asleep, Barbara tried to talk to me, but I nipped all her attempts in the bud. I absolutely didn't want to talk about anything. All I said coldly was, I need to go to bed. I have work tomorrow. After that, I started preparing my sleeping place on the couch in the living room. In the morning, I woke up to the noise in the kitchen. Barbara was making breakfast for the whole family as if nothing had happened. When I entered the room, she smiled cordially. Good morning. I made pancakes, your favorite. The kids already ate and went to get ready for school. Sit down. Let's have breakfast. She was clearly hoping that such homemaking gestures would establish contact and allow us to talk, but I remained distant. I had absolutely no appetite. I silently poured myself some coffee, took a sip, and put the cup in the sink. I grumbled, I have to get to work, heading for the exit. Barbara's whole family breakfast just disgusted me. I wasn't ready to talk to her right now, maybe sometime later. That evening, when I returned from work, my wife approached me again. Her eyes were red from crying. Listen, I know you don't want to talk to me right now, but sooner or later, we'll have to do it, she sobbed. Before continuing, she said, I didn't mean to betray you. It's just that night we had a little too much to drink with colleagues after work, and Josh gave me a ride home, and somehow it just happened. I swear it was only once. I regret it. Let's try to preserve the family for the sake of the children. However, her excuses only made me angrier. Impaired judgment indeed. More like she just decided to misbehave at my expense. I don't know what happened with you and how many times... I replied coldly, but either way, I'm filing for divorce. Our relationship is over. Now excuse me, I really need to rest after a working day. I turned to go to the bathroom and take a shower. I had no desire to listen to her pathetic excuses. The days before the divorce hearing were pure hell for me. I went to work like a zombie operating on autopilot. My boss even offered me paid leave so I could deal with family issues, but I refused because sitting at home would be even worse than just numbly functioning at work. That's where I least wanted to be. The only reason I came home was because of the kids. It was worth enduring for their sake. As for Barbara, she was clearly trying to appease me before the divorce. She cooked my favorite dishes, kept the house spotless, spoke to me gently, 
tried not to bother me unnecessarily. A couple of times, she even tried to seduce me physically, but her reconciliation attempts only angered me more. I didn't want anything from her except for this nightmare called divorce to end as soon as possible. Of course, the kids noticed that lately their parents were acting strange. I was gloomy and pensive, constantly distracted from all conversations. Barbara was also not at all like herself, quiet and sad. The children were worried. They didn't understand what was going on with mom and dad. One day, my son asked me, Dad, has something happened between you and mom? You argue all the time. My sister and I are concerned. I decided to have an honest talk with the kids and explain the situation in terms they could understand. I gently informed our children that their mom and I no longer love each other as we used to, and soon we will stop being husband and wife, meaning we'll get a divorce. They were upset by this news, but I assured them that we will both continue to love them and spend time with them, just living separately. I promised them they could always count on my support and care no matter what. This reassured the kids a little. Barbara kept desperately trying to regain my affection, apologizing and begging me to give her a chance to earn back my trust, but I only felt irritated. It seemed she didn't want to accept reality. Our relationship was over. I decided to take an indirect approach to make her understand. All right, I said, if you really regret it and want to regain my trust, you'll have to do something first. Take a lie detector test to answer all my questions honestly. Second, get tested for sexually transmitted infections to rule out any contagion. If the results come back negative, I may be able to forgive you. I understood these conditions would sound humiliating to her. I wasn't actually interested in the lie detector or test results, but I needed Barbara to realize the gravity of the situation and the consequences of her actions and to see just how much she had destroyed my trust in her with her betrayal. Maybe then she would finally back off and stop clinging to our dead relationship. To my surprise, my wife agreed to these terms. She kept delaying the lie detector, apparently fearing uncomfortable questions, but she immediately got tested for infections, being absolutely confident of a negative result. However, an unpleasant surprise awaited her a few days later. The results showed that Barbara had tested positive for HIV. I was shocked by the news. In a panic, I immediately got tested too. Those were the most stressful days of my life as I awaited results. Thankfully, my indicators came back clean despite my wife's infidelity. I had avoided infection but now had the opportunity for a special revenge. I just had to take advantage of it. I knew... Josh was Barbara's colleague and worked with her in the same office. I understood what a commotion it would cause if it turned out colleagues were having intimate relations and transmitting a dangerous infection to each other. Moreover, there was a risk Barbara and Josh had slept not only with each other, but with other subordinates too. Getting them fired and subsequently disgraced would be the perfect revenge. After receiving Barbara's test results... I scheduled a meeting with the head of the company where my wife worked, explaining beforehand to his secretary the urgency of the matter. At the meeting, I relayed the situation. Barbara had cheated on me with her colleague Josh, possibly right in the office, violating corporate ethics. As a result, she had contracted HIV. I demanded they immediately fire her and Josh since their irresponsible behavior could jeopardize the health of all other employees. I reminded the manager that by law, the employer bears responsibility for the health and safety of employees. I described the scale of damage if these two had infected others. In this case, the employer had legal grounds to terminate my wife and her lover to ensure the safety of remaining staff and visitors. The gravity of it quickly dawned on the manager. He promised to investigate and take necessary action within his authority and current legislation. After such news, he would have no choice but to fire Barbara and Josh and demand all employees undergo mandatory HIV testing. When Barbara found out about her dismissal, she furiously attacked me. It was you who lied to them, wasn't it? You accused me of things that never happened. In reality, you were the one cheating on me all these years. 
and you infected me with HIV, but now you're framing me as the guilty one, she yelled. I just bitterly smirked at these delusional accusations. Of course, it was just a desperate attempt at manipulation on her part. After all, according to my tests, I'm completely healthy and could not have transmitted HIV to her in any way. However, the mandatory HIV testing conducted at Barbara's company revealed a grim picture. It turned out that, in addition to my wife and Josh, several other employees had also tested positive. It looked like there really were some promiscuous sexual relations between colleagues there, and Barbara was far from the only victim of that debauched atmosphere. Thanks to this situation, I now had a real chance of getting custody of our children. According to my lawyer, I could now prove that I was a healthy and responsible parent unlike Barbara. I don't have HIV or other diseases. My wife led a moral and chaotic lifestyle, as evidenced by her workplace behavior, and could be a bad influence on the children. Due to her illness, Barbara would not be able to fully care for and provide for the kids, especially now that she was unemployed. I was financially stable and could give the children everything they needed. Thus, if my lawyer and I substantiated all these points in court, I would have every reason to get full custody of the children after the divorce from Barbara. Divorce is like entering a new reality where you look at your life with a clean slate. Fortunately, after all that legal tangle, I became a real single parent with two kids on my hands. Finally, the nightmare was over, and I could breathe freely again. I had to sell our house to divide assets with my ex-wife. I temporarily moved in with my parents with the kids while I saved up enough money to buy my own house or decide to take out a loan. My parents' support was invaluable, especially when I went to work. Someone had to look after the children in my absence. Work probably became my island of safety and stability in this sea of change. My boss knew about the difficult family situation, so she sometimes cut me some slack, allowing me to leave work early, for example. I turned down vacation time because I wanted to find a new home or apartment as soon as possible and get settled so my kids could live comfortably. Gradually, everything was falling into place, and Calm was returning to my life, but not to my ex-wife's life. Finding herself in dire straits, Barbara sued Josh for deliberate HIV infection. Fear and anxiety stared reality in the face. That's what she was experiencing now. Her life became like a picture torn to pieces. Every trial was like a blow to her emotional state. Under stress and uncertainty about the future, Barbara lost weight, and her eyes reflected fatigue and melancholy. I used to be used to seeing joy on her face, but now it was the shadow of a past life. The lack of peace and the storm of emotions took their toll on her appearance. The sparkle in her eyes faded. Her skin lost its freshness. When she came to visit the children, it was clear she wasn't paying proper attention to herself. Her hair was lifeless, and her clothes didn't fit as well. She seemed to have forgotten how important it is to take care of herself. My parents, having noticed these changes, expressed concern about her condition, but she seemed to have retreated far into her inner world, consumed by legal troubles and her own struggles. Time was not kind to her, and stress left its mark on her appearance, underlining just how difficult her days had become. Barbara did try to see the kids, but most times, these were brief visits. I felt she lacked the strength and resources for regular interaction. The promises she made about caring for the children now seemed like empty assurances. I grasped the fact that she couldn't provide the level of care they needed. The lawsuits and her fight for her rights had consumed her to the point where she couldn't be fully present in the children's lives. During this time, my parents became a reliable pillar of support for the grandchildren, filling the void left by maternal care. As I worked on building our new life, my ex-wife became entangled in a maze of lawsuits and her own difficulties. The divorce not only exposed our personal disagreements, but also highlighted Barbara's incapacity to fulfill the role of a caring mother. 
Life after divorce involves taking many small steps. Initially, you navigate through a storm of emotions gradually moving towards realism. A new apartment, new routines, new responsibilities, these become part of the journey. Somewhere along the way, you begin to realize that you're okay, that you can handle it, and most importantly, that you're not alone in this swim. Family and children become your foothold enabling you to move forward, taking little steps in your new life and rebuilding it anew.